Today we're going to be talking about all things med school applications and this is aimed at those of you applying in 2020. So guys, as I said, welcome back. Welcome to the start of a brand new series. This is going to be my guide to applying to medical school in 2020 for 2021 entry, a chance to update all the past videos I've made and consolidate them in one new series. As you're no doubt aware, applying to medical school can be a complicated and quite difficult process, particularly if you don't have anyone to guide you. And this video is going out in April to give you plenty of time to hit the dates that you need to hit in order to be successful with your application. This first video, we're going to try and superficially address each of the key concepts that you need to be aware of, and then we'll spend specific videos talking about each one as we go. But before we do continue, I'm really keen for this series to be guided by you watching this video at home. Obviously, I know what I think is important, but this series is intended to help coach you guys through the process. So if there are particular things you want to know about or you think I've not covered in appropriate depth, please do use the comments section to let me know. Let's jump right in with one of the most fundamental parts of applying to medical school, which is your grades. Medicine is one of the most competitive university courses that you can study. This is true pretty much anywhere in the world. And in the UK, we're looking at between nine and 10 applicants per place on average for every place at medical school. And that's why I think it's really important to emphasize before we go any further, that not getting a place at medical school in any given application cycle is not a mark of failure. And it certainly doesn't mean that you won't be a doctor one day. Literally, the only thing that will stop you becoming a doctor one day is you giving up on pursuing it. As long as you're willing to keep trying, there is virtually always a way for you to get to medical school. So returning to grades then, because it's so competitive, because everyone wants to study medicine and become a doctor, you'll need good grades. And in practice, this means straight A's at A-level, a minimum of three A grades. The most commonly required subject for medicine historically has been chemistry, followed secondly by biology, and from there, you'll actually need to start looking at the different prospectuses and medical school websites to see their feelings on that third subject. There's the temptation, and I did this myself. You know, I took biology, chemistry, I took physics as my third subject. People usually want to take physics or maths, but actually this might not be the best solution for you. Because ultimately, what's more important than having maybe three sciences or maths in there is actually getting that third A grade. That's the key factor. So if you're applying for schools that don't really care about that third subject and you think you'd do better in something like English or history or psychology, if it's more likely to get you that third A grade, then go for it. You should always be mindful that certain subjects such as general studies and critical thinking are rarely accepted by medical schools. They tend to make this very clear. And then the last thing to think about is retaking exams. If you've needed to take time out or retake a particular exam or set of exams, different medical schools have different tolerances for that sort of thing. So again, do your reading beforehand. Then the last thing to say is GCSEs. Again, it's a matter of individual school preference, but I would be looking for a handful of A grades, if not a handful of A star grades before I even thought about applying for medicine. Certainly you'll want decent grades in the sciences. If you're not applying with your A-levels from sixth form or college and you instead already have a degree or you will expect to have a degree by the time you start medical school, usually you will need a 2-1, an upper second class honours degree. This may or may not be in a science subject. Usually the best pick is going to be a life sciences degree of some sort, something like biology or chemistry or biomedical sciences, because life science courses are the most widely accepted by graduate entry medical programmes. However, really important to note that some medical schools like Swansea, like Warwick, will accept a degree in any subject. So there is scope to just pick a course that you think you'll enjoy rather than feeling that you have to be on that fast track to medicine because you don't. So now that we've got our grades out of the way, the second thing we need is some work experience. And this is really important because it exposes you to the healthcare system, to the NHS, how healthcare is actually delivered in the UK, what it means, what is healthcare, how is it provided, how do people experience it. You've got a few options of things you can try to do. You might shadow a hospital doctor or a surgeon. You might observe in your local GP surgery or your local pharmacy, or you might volunteer in a care home. The really crucial thing to remember about work experience is the type of work experience that you do 
and really what you see during it has no bearing on whether or not you'll be accepted to medical school or not. So don't worry, you know, if someone's got parents who are doctors and they did shadowing in the middle of London and, you know, I saw 14 open heart surgeries during my work experience, it doesn't matter, medical schools don't care. Medical schools are very, very aware that not everyone has the same work experience opportunities due to connections or other factors. And at particular times, especially at the moment, work experience can be incredibly difficult to come by. What ultimately matters and what a medical school is interested in is that you show that you have at least tried to engage with the healthcare system and tried to gain some experience in some way. The two things that I would prioritise investigating above all else are trying to investigate what a medical career might actually be like, what being a medical student might be like, what being a doctor might be like, but the single most crucial thing to try and find out is what it means to be a patient. How does it feel to be a patient? What does it mean to be unwell? And what is that patient's relationship like with the health system? It is much more that side of things that medical schools will want to know that you've engaged with. Trying to get experience of hands-on healthcare yourself and knowing how you deal with that kind of difficult environment, that's the key. Even if that means going to your local nursing home and making them tea and coffee, or sitting with the residents and playing board games with them, which is what I did when I was 16. At the time, it doesn't feel like you're doing very much, like you're not really contributing to their healthcare, but actually, in retrospect, it makes a huge amount of difference, not just to the staff, but to the residents themselves, who usually have no one to talk to. I think we have a tendency to underestimate the value of small pastoral things like that, and it really does make a huge difference. So now you've got the grades, you've got the work experience, you're convinced you're going to be a good doctor, which of course you are. But now it's time to hit the entrance exams. As we said before, medical school is very, very competitive. This means that virtually everyone applying will be a suitable candidate in terms of their grades, their work experience, their CV. Everyone will be very similar. So medical schools now need another way to try and separate out candidates and rank them, and this is where the entrance exams come in. This is done in the UK via a test called the UCAT, alternatively another one called the BMAT, or if you're a graduate entry medical applicant, a third test called the GAMSAT. A common theme is that these are all aptitude tests rather than direct tests of your abilities. What this means in practice is that they're often quite difficult to prepare for and they will be unlike most tests that you're used to taking. Now the first one is the UCAS, which stands for the University Clinical Aptitude Test. It's by far the most common, it's the simplest relatively to prepare for, and if you're only going to take one, I recommend that you take the UCAT. Now the UCAT has to be taken between July and October of the year in which you intend to apply to medical school, not the year in which you would be starting. So this might be between the first and second years of your A-level studies, for example, if you're at sixth form, or it might be between the second and third years of a bachelor's degree. So what this means is if you want to start medical school in September 2021, you'll need to take the UCAT in the summer of 2020, which is obviously where we're coming up to now. It's a multiple choice exam, which tests five domains, which are verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, decision making, and situational judgment. That's enough for now, but don't worry, we will spend a dedicated video talking about each of these individual UCAT subsections and the tips and tricks that I've come across to help you tackle them properly. Then the last thing to note about the UCAT is that it has to be taken at a Pearson test centre. There are many across the UK. If you've ever done your driving theory test, it's one of those centres where you had that done. The UCAT can only be taken once a year, but you do get your results immediately as soon as you finish the test. The BMAT, the Biomedical Admissions Test, is the second most common. It's used by a smaller number of medical schools than the UCAT, and the content is slightly different. It has three domains which are aptitude and skills, scientific knowledge and applications, and then a writing task. Unlike the UCAT, the BMAT has to be taken in an authorised testing centre, but this testing centre is usually a sixth form or a college. Most of the time your own school can request to have it sent in and put it on for you. You'll just have to make sure you give them plenty of notice if you want to take the BMAT. There are various sit dates throughout the year as well, so you can pick the one that best suits you. Do just note with the BMAT that it does take several weeks to get your results back because it all has to be marked independently. And what this means is that if you take the sit that's very close to when medical applications get sent off, then you might not know what your score is 
before you apply to medical school. You can still apply and they will still get the score when they're released, it'll be fine. You just won't know how well you've done. Then the last test is the GAMSAT, the Graduate Medical School Admissions Test, which is used by some graduate entry medical programs. It's a bit more complicated, it's a more intensive exam, tests the social sciences as well as all the basic sciences, features two long writing tasks as well. This third test requires a lot more dedicated preparation, it's more expensive and it's more difficult. But because of this, fewer people take it every year than take the other tests, so it's up to you to decide whether or not it's something you want to consider. But regardless of which of these three tests you choose to take, the same principles apply from here on, which is that medical schools will look at the distribution of scores, so they'll look at how well everyone did, because these are nationally standardised exams, and then they will apply some sort of arbitrary cutoff. So they might decide that they want a student who did in the top 20% on the UCAT, or a different school might decide they want a BMAT score in the top 30%. Or an alternative is they might emphasise a particular subsection or domain of one of the tests. So if they're a UCAT using school, they might put emphasis on their verbal reasoning score, or maybe on their decision making score. And don't worry, each school only uses one entrance exam and it's very consistent year to year. So now, we've got our grades, we've got our work experience, we have smashed the entrance exams. Now it comes time to actually apply to medical school. The deadline for this every year is the 15th of October. So this year, 15th of October 2020, this is the time by which your application must be in and registered with absolutely no exceptions. This is earlier than the application deadlines for most university courses, this is simply to allow the system to deal with the huge numbers of applications for medical, dental and vet school. Your application is made through a system called UCAS, the Universities and Colleges Admissions System, which is essentially just an online portal that you can plug in all your details, your grades, everything you need to submit all in one place, like a package. Then the medical school gets all this information all at once and they can use it to assess you and your performance. Entry through UCAS is normally handled by your sixth form, your college, your university maybe if you're a student, although you can apply by yourself as well as an independent. It can be a bit more difficult if you're not familiar with the system, to keep things very, very simple, you can apply for five courses at university each year. But crucially, only four of these can be for medicine. But the most common course of action is choose four medical schools and then a fifth non-medical course just as an insurance choice if things don't go to plan. That fifth choice might be something like a life sciences degree, something like biomedical sciences, biology, or it could be something else entirely. It's up to you. Then attached to your UCAS application are two more final things. The first is a reference. Your reference is essentially a letter of support. It might be from a teacher or a tutor, someone at your educational institution who knows you well. This letter just needs to tell the medical school what kind of student you are, why they think you would make a good doctor, how well they think you'll cope with the course. So this is why it's really important to choose someone that knows you well, that you feel understands you properly and wants you to succeed because that's how the best letter of reference is gonna come out. Then the last part of the application process is the personal statement. This is difficult because it's restricted to 47 lines of text or 4,000 characters, whichever comes first. In practice, that comes out to just under 500 words or approximately a side of A4. And this is much more difficult to do well than it sounds because in this one short document you're trying to sum up everything about who you are, the work experience you've done, why you think you would make a good doctor, your passion for the sciences and medicine, and any other relevant information. It's not a lot of space at all. But because it's so tricky, we're going to spend a dedicated video talking about it, so don't worry about it for now. So October the 15th rolls around, our application is sent off and the medical schools receive it. The next step is being invited to interview, which is the last but potentially the most daunting part of the process. This takes two formats. This will either be a traditional panel interview, you sat on one side of a table talking to one, two, three interviewers and spending 45 minutes, an hour, answering their questions. They can get to know you and get a feel for how you solve problems. The more common format now is what's called the multiple mini interview or the MMI. And what happens in this format is you'll rotate round a series of discrete short stations, which might only be five or six minutes, and you might do six to eight to ten of them. Different schools do different things. But the idea with this format 
is that it allows the medical school to test a wide range of skills because they can give you a discrete scenario each time and it's considered a blank slate for you to do your best with. Now, regardless of which type of interview you have, and you may experience both types when applying to medical school, there are some core skills that you can pretty much guarantee you'll be examined on. These are things like your empathy, your communication skills, your problem solving, your ethical reasoning, skills that you would want your doctor to have. And I've covered a ton of these interview questions elsewhere on the channel. I'll link a few in the description. Make sure you have a click around and you can get a feel for the types of questions that you might be asked and how you might go about tackling them. After your interviews, it's a case of playing the world's most difficult waiting game. There are three outcomes that can happen at this point, just to keep it simple. And the first is an offer. This means that you've got that place at medical school still subject to meeting any entry requirements for the course. So if you still don't have your final A-level results or you're waiting for the final degree result that you might get from university, you still need to meet the minimum requirements. The optimum situation is receiving more than one offer, in which case you'll be required to choose one to firm and one as an insurance. A firm choice means that if you get the grades that you need to go to your top choice, you're guaranteed that place. An insurance choice means if you don't get the grades or the entry requirements for your top choice, but you do satisfy the requirements for your second choice, then you'll get that second choice place. You're still safe. The other major outcome obviously is a rejection. This means that you don't have a place at that medical school for that year. Don't worry about rejections. I got three before hearing anything back from my fourth medical school that I'd applied to. And a rejection absolutely doesn't mean that you'd be unsuitable for the course or you wouldn't be a good doctor. Competition is super high and it just means that someone pipped you to it this year, but that's just the way it works. Then the third outcome, this is unusual, but it does happen. If you were very, very close to getting the standard required to enter the course, some medical schools may choose to place you on a waiting list. Being on the waiting list basically means that if there are spare places available on the course as you get closer to the start date, they may just call you up and say, are you still free to come and study because we've got a space for you that's opened up. So what this means is that A, no news is good news, and B, it's never over till it's over. If you're on the waiting list, that's as good as anything at that point. And that's where I'm gonna wrap this video, guys. It's already gone on far too long. This was just intended to be a superficial summary of everything you need to know about the applying to medical school process. I hope I've captured everything. But if I haven't, let me know in the comments down below. If you've got questions, I'm always happy to answer them. If there are specific videos that you'd like to be made about particular parts of the process, let me know as well. I really want this series to be guided by you guys so I can make you the content that's useful for you. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Take care of yourselves and I will see you in another video. Thanks for watching guys. If you want to support the channel, there are three ways you can do it. The first is make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell to make sure you don't miss any uploads. The second is you can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the description, which will help keep me awake during the editing process. Then the third way of helping out is you can use my referral link for Complete Anatomy 2020 to save 10% off your first year subscription. I'll receive a small kickback when you do. It's my favorite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you in the next video.